Hi, I'm Nir. I'm from AppsFlyer. Uh, I've been there for the last five and a half years, which is almost from the beginning. Uh, I've been doing closure for uh, as a living for the past five years. Um, so, uh, like at the Reversing Summit a couple of months ago, Vishay came to me and talked to me and said to me, hey, listen, we want to do something about closure in weeks. And I said, closure weeks, like a Scala shop and what's... I said, yeah, yeah, we're some guys, we're doing some closure. And I said, okay, I'm going to come over. So I'm here. And um, uh, so, yeah, and the rest is history. So he told me Osvaldas is coming and I saw his lecture before and, and I, I saw he covers all the, all the basics of, of what is functional programming in closure. And I thought to myself, well, I'm, I've got nothing left to talk about, so I'm just going to code a bit, okay? So, uh, what, what do you usually do when you approach a new programming language? What I usually do? Um, I try to spin up a web server, right? That's what I usually do. How, how do I spin up a web server? Let's see how many lines of code I can spin up. So, that's what I'm going to do now in Clojure. Uh, um, uh, 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 a funny, uh, not a funny, a, a simple story uh, which relates deeply to what Osvaldos mentioned uh, in his talk. When we were at the beginning of, the, of Apps Live, everything was written in Python. Okay, so we were a Python workshop for the entire first year. And then as we grew, at the beginning, it was just uh, the two co founders. One of them was uh, my friend, he's my friend still, he's a CTO, and, uh, and myself. And uh, down the, like a year down the line, everything was written in Python. We had microservice architecture and um, messaging, and everything was hunky dory. And uh, stuff started to break because the scale grew. Right now, Epsilon is like 330 people, and 13 offices around the world, something like that. And and we knew we wanted uh, to to add another programming language to the arsenal, and we knew. It needed to be functional. Why? Because uh, um, AppStar does uh, uh, tracking of mobile uh, uh, ads. Uh, we knew we were going to get a lot of info coming into the system, and the best way, the easiest way to parallelize work on massive data uh, structures or massive data is using functional languages. So for two months, me and Reshef, we're sitting in the office, we're doing some Python code, but uh, uh, like 50% of the time we're doing Python code, and 50% of the time we're, we're evaluating functional programming languages. We've tested Erlang, we've tested Haskell, and Scala, and whatever, and after one, a month and a half, two months, uh, the candidates were either Scala or Clojure, basically for the JVM, right? Because the JVM is like a super rich environment and it's got all these libraries and ecosystem. Uh, but Clojure won and, and there wasn't really any debate. And, and the reason that it, that it won is because Clojure uh, takes the functional programming paradigm and puts it to the extreme. Like in Scala, you can do both ways, right? You can be OO, you can be functional. Usually what happens in most companies that transition from Java to Scala is that they start writing Java in Scala, right? That's what happens. Java. And what, what, it's got a name for it? Skaja. 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 Okay. Skaja. Sounds nasty. Skaja. So uh, it sounds like a disease. So so we wanted we wanted something that will for us force us to think differently. So we chose Clojure. So let's see. I'm going to demonstrate a bit how I code day to day uh, in Clojure how we spin up uh, like a new project, a new environment, and stuff like that. It's going to be super easy, go easy on me, it's a live demo, probably stuff will break, but let's go. So, Leningen is the de facto tool of integrating uh, with, uh, with the Clojure. There are alternatives, there's Boot, and now uh, Clojure 1.9 comes with its own uh, command line tools, blah, 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 blah. Leningen is the de facto tool. So if I want to create a new project, Lane, new, this is me creating a new project, let's call it in the awesome name web, okay? Wait for it, wait for it, that's it. I've got a new project, so let's go into the library and uh, let's make it uh, nicer. This is the directory structure, doesn't say a bit, I'm going to edit something very nice. It's not, it's not, it's not human for me. What? 
Yeah? Yeah, it's an auto. Yeah. So it's, it's, it does a lot of stuff. We'll see what, what, what else it does. So this is the core of every closure project. There's a project CLJ file, OK? And this CLJ file uh, states everything about your project. But uh, most importantly, here are the dependencies. So we see that this closure project, in order to work, it needs closure. This version that it needs, it's 1.8.0. 1.9.0 is already out, uh, but we're using uh, 1.8.0. And we're going to use, I'm going to add another library, which is called HTTP Kit. There are some libraries of doing web development in closure. There is a, a ring, and it's got like a, 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 its own jetty wrapper, and there's HTTP kit and some others. I'm going to demonstrate with HTTP kit because it's super easy. Um, but you can use whatever you want because most of them follow something that's called uh, the ring interface or the ring architecture, how, how we communicate between each other inside the, 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 the code. So this is my dependency, HTTP kit. OK. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to open up my editor because I'm super cool. I'm doing it in Vim. Even though the de facto editor of uh, Clojure is what? Emacs. OK, the de facto editor of, of Clojure is Emacs. So, so, so Let's talk about, about tooling a bit. So most of you come from the, from the Java world or the Scala world. So uh, IntelliJ IDEA has got a plugin called Cursive. It supports uh, uh, Clojure. It is for Clojure. Uh, most of the people that do Clojure for a living usually do it in Emacs because Emacs is written in Lisp and Clojure is a Lisp. So it's easy. The tooling around Lisp in Emacs is easy. I do it in Vim because I like Vim. So that's it. Um, and then the, th the second thing I do when I, when I open up my editor, I'm going to spin up the REPL. OK, so maybe this is the most important thing about Clojure. Clojure, I like to think a bit of it as a REPL-driven development environment. OK, so I, this is how I walk. I've got my, my editor here. Sorry, this is uh, I've got my editor, and I've got my REPL. Some people like to combine them into the same, the, the, in IntelliJ you can put the editor inside the, the IntelliJ or stuff like that. I like to have them separate, but that's me. Okay, so that's how we write code. Let's go to the source and the Leningen created a single file with a namespace called web.core. Okay, it also created a function foo that says I don't do a whole lot. It receives a single argument of x and print line uh, the x. Let's get rid of it. Okay. So we said we wanted to do some uh, uh, web, right? So let's add our dependency. So what I want to add is a dependency to the HTTP kit server. Okay. So I'm doing org HTTP kit. <coughs> dot server and I'm aliasing it as s so I don't have to write the fully qualified namespace all the time super easy up until now okay so I'm saving let's get rid of the warning here because it doesn't really matter so what I'm doing if you look down at the, at the bottom it says I'm running some tests I, I don't have any tests running but what I'm actually doing behind the scene I'm sending this code to the REPL okay I'm, I'm evaluating this S expression in the REPL. So if something breaks, it would have told me. If, if, I had, if, if I added something like that doesn't exist, and I run it, I get some exception. The exception is, I don't know what the org HTTP kit servers is. I know what org HTTP kit server is. OK? So everything I'm doing, I'm, I'm sending to this REPL here. My environment is configured that when uh, uh, the editor spins up, it knows how to find the correct REPL and connects to it. So whenever I'm striking some keys in my editor, it's sending the form to the REPL. OK, so we want to create a server, right? So as Osvaldes told you, let's define a function. Defn is how you define a function. And I'm going to call it create server. 
it receives no, no arguments. And what it's going to do, this is all the functions that are uh, under the uh, org HTTP kit server namespace. I'm going to do run server. OK? So let's look at it a bit more. Run server receives uh, a handler. And this is how you destruct a map. And these are the options for the server. So I'm not sure what the handler will be, but let's write it, right? And the options, I'm just going to give it a port. OK. So it, my editor now tells me, uh, listen, mister, I don't know how to resolve the symbol handler, because I've written something that it doesn't know. So let's define a handler. A handler, a ring handler, OK? And the ring, again, is the interface for, for web in Clojure. is something that receives a request and it returns a response. And the response is a hash map. I don't know if you remember. Osvaldo show you a, a slide of it. Let's do it live. I'm going to return a hash map that's going to have a status of 200, because everything is hunky-dory. It's going to have some headers. And the headers are going to say that the content type is text HTML. And we're going to have some body. Let's say we want the body to be I do remember how to do some HTML. <laughs> OK. So this is me. Oh, OK. So I've got here two functions. One function creates a server. And the other function is what the server is going to use as the actual handler. OK? So what I'm missing is another simple function. That's a function to stop the server. It will receive a server as the argument. This is how you stop a server of HTTP kit. The, the, uh, the actual code doesn't really matter. Just what matters is that I've got uh, uh, the function here. So I've written 13 lines of code. That's not a lot, right? It took me like two minutes, five minutes with explanations. And I've sent, I'm always sending the code to the REPL. So let's do the REPL a bit, okay? So right here, I'm in the REPL. And what I want is to use this namespace, the web.core namespace that I've defined. So let's use it. Require. The same thing, web.core. I'm going to alias it as C. Brilliant. And now we want to start a server. If I do a tab completion, it will, st it will uh, uh, stay. It will list all the functions, the public functions, in my namespace. So the function that I want is the create server. And I've created a server. So right now, I've got a server running on port 8080. Let's see. Brilliant. OK, so this is me live coding. Let's, let's stop the server and see that I'm not bullshitting. OK. OK, a few, things, a few things to note here. Let's return to the, uh, to the editor. 13 lines of code, org HTTP kit. Uh, HTTP kit is a wrapper around uh, the Netty server. OK, that means it is production ready. OK, uh, you can use it for production. We are using some kind of variants of this code with a lot of functionality behind the scenes. But the basic entry 
into our systems of all our web handlers, all our web methodology in AppStryer, looks something like this. Okay, so this is how you do production grade web handlers in Clojure in five minutes. That's not a lot. And that's like 13 lines of code. Okay, and that's just the basics. What I'm trying to say here is uh, uh, I'm trying to demonstrate a few things. First, um, it's really easy to get started with Clojure because Clojure, unlike certain languages or methodologies, uh, Clojure doesn't promote the ideas of a framework. Okay, we don't have a framework for web or a framework for a database access or whatever, right? Clojure, uh, if it promotes the concept of composition of function, it also promotes the concept of composition of libraries, okay? So if I want to use this library for, uh, uh, for a serving web, I use HTTP kit. This is the only thing that this library does. It knows how to serve HTTP calls, okay? If I want to do something uh, a bit different, like add like uh, route management, I've gonna, I'm gonna need to either do it on my own or add another library, right? Because again, the same, the same concepts. Every library deals with its own idea. Like it's a single responsibility principle, a bit bigger, okay? So this handler is kind of stupid, right? It doesn't do anything uh, uh, and it receives all, all the calls. And if I want to do some, uh, some nifty uh, routing logic behind it, I could take the request and start looking at the URI inside and start looking at the methods inside and start writing some functions that if say, if it's this kind of method and this kind of URI, then do this. If it's this kind of method, then this kind of URI, do that. I can write, sorry, all this code on my own, but I don't need to because I've got a library for it, okay? So let's go out of the REPL for a bit and go back into the project and add another library. And spin up the REPL again. So Composure is the uh, uh, closure library that mostly deals with routing, okay? Uh, let's see how that goes. So We'll add Composure here. All right. So, let's say I want to do some routing. How do I do it? Can you explain what refer does? What refer does? Yes, refer, refer when you require stuff from other closure namespaces, you have two keywords that you can use. As is an alias for the entire namespace as a single whatever you want to call it, okay? And refer takes only these functions or symbols from this namespace and pours them into your own namespace so you can use them without any prefix notation. Okay, this is refer. You can also do, you can also combine the refer and as. So I can do refer as if I want to. I can do something like that, but I don't need to. So let's leave it like this. So right now I'm building something even, uh, uh, even niftier. So let's call it an app. And the app will have some routes. Okay. Another thing to, to notice about uh, the, the brackets situation in Clojure. Uh, brackets make it super easy to know the scope of what you're doing. If you're inside the brackets, you're inside the scope. Okay, outside the brackets, outside the scope. S easy as that. Okay. So I'm defining uh, some routes. Let, let's define the root route.
And let's say that it returns the same thing. Let's do some nifty indentation. And look, this, this is outside of the scope of the get, so I'm going to put it inside the scope. OK? So what I've, def what I've defined now is I've defined a single route, which will only answer if the HTTP method is get. OK? The URL is the root URL. OK? And I'm returning the exact same thing, but let's just say that now I'm returning it from, from the root. What I've got to do now is to use the app. And let's do the exact same thing. I'm going to create a server. I'm going to press a F5, and this is the exact same thing, only now with routing, OK? So let's say I want to add another route. Another route that, uh, that's something like this. But let's say that, uh, that after the slash, I'm going to provide part of the path is going to be a username, OK? What? Name parameter. Name parameter, exactly. So I'm binding this name parameter of the path to this variable, to this symbol. And I'm still keeping the rest of the request if I want to use it. I don't need this part, the as request, but if I want to use the rest of the request, I can still use it. And let's say, I'm going to return the exact same thing, except that here I'm going to do some uh, string formatting. Um, okay, so what I'm doing right now, I'm taking, um, uh, so this is if I'm, if this is the routing, the root is going to return this thing. If I'm uh, uh, giving it a single slash and a path, single path part, that's going to be bound to a symbol called username. And I'm, and I'm going to return in the body hi from the username with a simple string formatting, OK? Let's see it at work. I'm going to stop and st start the server again. So the root isn't supposed to be changed, right? But if I'm going to change the path, this is me, OK? So this is how I do routing closure. Again, it didn't take me that long, right? Like a couple of minutes, handling some routes. Usually what happens is you define some routes in closure. And they will invoke some functions. And the functions will do whatever business logic that you want to do. The project can be a mile long and an inch deep, but it can do whatever you want it to do. But at the end, it will always return a hash map. And the hash map will always have the status code, the headers, body if you want, OK? That's the ring, OK? So this is me spinning up, so let's get rid of this. So this is me spinning up a, um, a web server enclosure, really, really easy. Look at this, this call. Let's stay a bit and, and contemplate what we've done here. So I, I've intentionally, I've, I've called this method create server, even though that the HTTP kit method is called run server, why? because it returns something, OK? I'm creating a server, and I'm binding it into a variable called server. 
So let's talk a bit about state. <laughs> Uh, state enclosure. So how do you do, how do you deal with state enclosure? Uh, there is no easy or simple answer, okay? So because if I want to run my application, at the end it, it's, it's a Java application, right? So I need to have some uh, main function, right? And it will need to do something like uh, create some local variables, let server, create server, blah, 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 blah. But someone will need to hold this reference. So who will hold this reference? Um, again, no, no simple answer. We can do it either on the main. We can use, there are some libraries that know how to deal with this whole um, idea of, of life cycle of state that has a life cycle that you start and stop it. Examples are HTTP servers, database connections, stuff like that. Uh, one uh, library that comes to mind is Stuart Sierra Component. Another library that comes to mind is Mount. Uh, you can do it like I did here. Just, create, just making it with pure function. And you can do something like this. You can if you're in the namespace of, of the web core, you can define a variable. Def1s def is, def, is like def, defining a variable, but once means it's singleton. Okay, that's it. This notes that it's private. That means that no one from, that everyone from outside the namespace won't have access to it. Only people from, only methods from inside the namespace. And I want to call it, uh, let's call it a server. And it will be an atom, and its initial value will be nil, null, none, whatever. Okay? So then I can create another function that's called run server. Again, it accepts nothing, but what it does, it resets the value of the server with this function. Okay? So there are two ways, uh, this is just two ways of, of, of doing, uh, 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 of handling the state of the actual server. You can keep it, right now I'm keeping it in the REPL because the REPL is a running environment of the JVM. I can keep it because everything, as long as I'm in the REPL, everything is alive, right? But if I leave the REPL, this is me leaving the REPL, and I refresh, the web server is dead because I'm, I'm out of context. I'll spin it up again, and again, I need to recreate the server, but then it will leave again. So you can either hold the state on your own, you can put it in an atom, you can use some libraries. There are all methods of, uh, of arguments for and against various methodologies. I won't go into it, but just to show you that there are ways of doing it, okay? Um, one simple thing to... I'm gonna try something uh, less bit of live coding. So we've talked a bit about closure, we talked a bit about libraries in the notion of composability and single responsibility. We talked a bit about uh, um, state and the ways of maybe dealing with it. I've thrown a lot of stuff in the air, but stuff is out there. You can look it up on your own. And let's look, and we talked a bit, a bit about ring, right? The architecture. Uh, I'm gonna do my last uh, live code exercise for today, and I'm gonna write a middleware, okay? So what is a ring middleware? A ring middleware is, uh, um, is actually a function, okay? It's a function that uh, can alter the way that your application works, okay? Uh, I'm going to do a, a super simple uh, exercise. Um, I'm going to write a ring middleware that gets rid of tailing, trailing backslashes, okay? Because most of the time, let's do this again, just a second.
So this is high from near, but if I had a trailing backslash to near, there's no route that handles it, right? But usually, uh, users are sometimes not that intelligent, <laughs> and sometimes they'll add a trailing backslash, okay? So if I want my application to handle stuff that also uh, ends with trailing backslash, let's write a middleware to do it. Instead, uh, instead of writing explicit uh, get for username and get for username with slash. Get for something, get for something with slash. Instead of doing all the time, let's write a middleware. So a middleware, um, receives a handler. And it returns a function that receives a request. Why? Because that's how ring works. Ring is a handler that walks over a function that receives a request. That's it. So let's see what we're going to do here. I'm going to de define some local variables. First, let's take the URI from the request. For those of you that don't know closure, uh, 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 for those of you that don't know Clojure, so a request is a hash map. Usually in Clojure, uh, uh, the keys of the hash map are, uh, are not strings. There's something called keywords. This is the stuff that starts with the uh, um, column. column. And, um, and they're a function of their own. They're a function over the hash map. When I invoke the function URI over the hash map, it looks for itself inside the hash map and it re returns its value if it exists. If it doesn't exist, it will return a nil. But I have a URI in the request, or so I think should be good. And then let's see. Um, If the URI is a single slash, that means I'm the root. I want to check that I'm not the root, so I'm checking that the URI is not equals to slash. That's it. So what do we have here? And I'm going to explain this bit. So this is me invoking Java from Clojure. OK? So every string in Java has got a function that's called hands with, right? So I want to invoke this over the URI, because the URI is a Java string at the end, right? So this is how you invoke functions from Java. You do, it starts with the function itself, because we're Clojure. Always begin with the function, okay? So it, this is the function, dot ends with, and this is a string. What I'm giving it here is a type hint. I'm hinting to the compiler that the URI is a string Y, because if I don't hint, it will do it via reflection. Okay, and reflection is costly. So whenever I'm doing some Java interop, I try to, do, to give it some type hints. Okay, so this is the type in that says, hey, listen, this is a string. A string has got a function that's called ends with, use that. Don't, don't do it via reflection. So what I'm, ending, what I'm checking here is whether or not I'm, uh, the, uh, the URI ends with a slash. So uh, uh, note that in Clojure you can use question mark as the name of the well, in the name of the variables, which make it simple uh, and easy to reason about. And also dashes, and also uh, usually whenever you've got something that tr transforms from x to y, you can call it, you can call a function like this, from x to y, you can use stuff like that. Closure naming is, is expressive. So what I want to do now, I want to do a simple if. Fix your if. And if I'm not root, 
and I'm ends with a slash. Okay, Sada, this is will be the return value. But if if not, let's return the same exact URI. But if I want to do the exact URI without the string slash, substring exactly. Subs for URI from zero to count of URI. Count is exclusive. Uh, sorry, subs is exclusive. But I've got to take this minus one, right? Decrement. This with one. And then, what I'm doing then. Let's do let's do it more expressive. Uh, fixed request. Assess request. So what I'm doing now, I'm creating, I'm I'm overriding the request. Okay, the request is a hash map. Is a hash map. I'm assessing into the request in the place of the URI, the fixed URI. So. Sometimes it will be exactly the same. Sometimes it will change without the training backslash. But I'm overriding the URI. And then I'm doing whatever the handler wanted to do beforehand. I'm, doing the, I'm invoking the handler function over the fixed request. And this is the return value of this function. This is a middleware. I don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> what? One slash, not two. The, the end trailing slash, that's what it wants to remove, the end, okay? <coughs> so how do, how do we uh, uh, wrap? Uh, we just wrap the, the application, the routes, with the middleware, sorry. So this is near without trailing, this is with trailing, and it still works. This is the middle one. Okay? Live coding. Um, 37 lines of code, yes. Okay, so the question was if, if I don't want to do an in-place uh, rewrite, if I don't want to do some redirect, the, the, uh, the code is here is yours. You can do whatever you want because it's just, again, it's functions over you take a hash map and you return a hash map. That's it. What the handler over the fixed request does, it returns a hash map. You can return whatever hash map you want from it. Write whatever logic you want. This is just my example, okay? So you can do whatever you want with it. You can do the routing, you can do whatever. You can even override, you can the source over the request, not the URL, you can do like a different, uh, different, uh, different thing, a different parameter, and do whatever you want with it down the line, okay? Um, this is not clean closure code, why? Because uh, I've got a lot of junk here. Probably the middleware shouldn't reside within uh, they, the, the context that deals with web, probably the middleware should resign in the middleware namespace and stuff like that. But this is just to give you a taste of what you can do with Clojure, how easy and fast and easy. <laughs> easy. Especially easy. And the parentheses are not that. Once you've got like rainbow coloring and stuff like that, it's all nice and fluffy like unicorns. How, how is stuff represented in Clojure uh, in Java? That was the question, right? Uh, when I compile it in bytecode. So most of the time I know uh, uh, um, because I wanted to know. A lot of the time I don't care. I don't care. A lot of the time I only care if I see some performance issues or stuff like that. I can do whatever I want. I can put profilers inside and look at the, the, at the method invocation and see the pain points, no problem. It's a Java application par excellence. 
Questions? Yeah, so uh, the question was, do I find the, the flexibility of closure a problem uh, in regards to libraries, coding and stuff? Uh, when you're small, it's easy. When you're larger, it's more difficult. But if you've got good, probable coding standards and methodology, it alleviates a lot of the problem. Dynamic typing is both a blessing and a curse, right? Because uh, if you look at the code, if you look at the code, uh, I don't know what the types are here. Like, I know that there are functions and I know that there are hash maps, I don't know the contents. Someone can add, someone can remove, someone, a lot of people can do a lot of harm. But usually, if it's a smaller project, it's okay. We try to keep in AppsFlyer, it's a microservice architecture, the same way that everybody does it. So we try to keep the project small. But even as the projects grow larger, we sometimes, sorry, yield to uh, maybe defining a schema over data types using either schema by, uh, by Prism or, uh, or uh, the new schema library of Clojure. Uh, what? Closure spec, yeah. Uh, it, it's still, the, the closure 1.9.0 is, is officially out, but spec is still in, in alpha phase. Doesn't really matter because you can, we still use it, but a lot of the time I find that uh, the schema library by Plumatic, it was Prismatic, but I think they rebranded it Plumatic. Uh, for me, it's a bit more idiomatic at the moment. So most of the time we use that, if at all. Because if the project is small and you've got some, some uh, 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 remarks or notations and stuff like that, you're usually in the safe zone. But I agree that as you grow larger, uh, uh, it becomes a hazard. So right now, the big project that we're going to work on at the beginning of uh, this year, 2018, is we're going to have a unified message format that combines, that goes through all of our services. We started work on it like some times ago, conceptually, but this year, this year we're going to do it. But I agree, it's a pain point. Again, a pain and a hazard and a blessing. Dyna it's, it's the, but it's the same way for all dynamic typing, right? You write code in Python, you write code in Ruby, you write code in Erlang, in, in Elixir, it's the same thing. Okay, dynamic typing is both a blessing because if I want to right now uh, uh, convert a JSON object into a closure map, I do it with a function, a single function call. I, I don't have to create an object and map all the fields and whatever, uh, but again, so the question was, did we, did, we, did we run into some production, serious production issues because of dynamic typing? No, and the simple answer is, is because we have uh, uh, tests, yes, but uh, mostly we rely not only on unit testing, which is good on their own end, we usually do a lot of integration tests and end-to-end -end tests, which uh, test the, the entire either service or flow as a unit, okay? So that's how we do it. The question was if I sometimes find myself writing tests that the, the compiler could have saved me if there were types. Uh, usually no. Usually no. If I, if I come to that point, I usually uh, define a schema. Okay, if I come to that end. What were the biggest wins for us when we moved to Clojure? Well, uh, we were multi-threaded because in Python you've got the global interpreter lock, so you're not multi-threaded. Uh, but I, listen, at the, it's, it's not, it's, we, we haven't transitioned an entire company from technology X to technology to closure. When we moved to closure, it was just two guys. It was me and the CTO. So it was easy. So everyone that came afterwards, he knew he had to do it in closure. So yes, there's a bit of a learning curve. Yes, it's a bit more difficult. But after like, right now we've got an extensive training program that runs almost to two months of doing stuff in AppsFlyer, including a big emphasis on closure. And after two months, people are proficient enough to start writing and fixing and doing. It's okay. Even, even sometimes with, with the junior developers, it's even easier because they don't have this entire baggage of OO of an imperative programming of a decade, you know, sometimes stuff like that. Of, but I, I had some closure code in AppsFlyer that had something with 
DAO, data access, whatever, and it, uh, people that came from the Java world sometimes wrote stuff, and we try to refactor it all of the time to get rid of these namespaces that are controller or DAO or uh, whatever, whatever. Thank you. <laughs>